The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Amen, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or the smallest part of a letter will pass from the law until all things have taken place. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys and teaches these commandments will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to your ancestors, you shall not kill and whoever kills will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with brother will be liable to judgment. And whoever says to brother, Raka, will be answerable to the Sanhedrin. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to fiery Gehenna. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there recall that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar. Go first and be reconciled with your brother. Then come offer your gift. Settle with your opponent quickly while on the way to court. Otherwise, your opponent will hand you over to judge the judge will hand you over to the guard and you'll be thrown into prison. Amen, I say to you, you will not be released until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into Gehenna. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than to have your whole body go into Gehenna. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a bill of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, unless the marriage is unlawful, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it was said to your ancestors, do not take a false oath but make good to the Lord all that you vow. But I say to you, do not swear at all, not by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make a single hair white, or black. Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Anything more is from the evil one. The Gospel of the Lord. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I I urge all of you to memorize the opening lines of the gospel today. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Memorize this. Keep this in your heart, and it will protect you from all sorts of things. You heard in the first reading how God says, To none does he give license to sin. God does not give us permission to sin. So in our time, especially when there's so much confusion, we must remember morality is the same. Nothing has changed. There's a temptation to play good cop versus bad cop. Uh, So we make distinctions, a dichotomy. We say, Jesus good, Pharisees bad. Boo, everyone hates Pharisees. They're horrible. Or in our time, Jesus good, church bad. And then we have uh, that uh, slogan that they put on cars and uh, keychains, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And people who say what would Jesus do almost always mean Jesus would do exactly what I tell him to. Okay, this is a load of nonsense. It comes from that spirit of Jesus good, law is bad or the law is strict, Old Testament. But Jesus came and he set us free and he's very jolly and fluffy and he's marvelous. Isn't that right? Well, in the gospel you heard, what did you actually hear? It's called the four antitheses. Jesus uses the same formula four times. He said, you have heard it was said to your fathers, but I say to you. Now, first of all, who does he think he is? I say to you. He is the lawgiver. He is Adonai, the God of Sinai, who gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. This is who Jesus is. And so he clarifies the law. He doesn't loosen Moses' law. In fact, he makes it stricter, tighter. So the first one says, thou thou shalt not kill, etc. And then he says, but I say to you, don't even be angry with your brother. Do not commit adultery. And he says, don't even look at someone lustfully. Divorce, Jesus clarifies, this was not from the beginning. Whoever divorces his wife, marries another, commits adultery, and and vice versa. And then the fourth one, on oaths and vows. Not to swear by anything, but just to let your yes be yes, and your no, no. So here he says, I have come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He summarizes all of this as, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. What is the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? It's the modern world. It's this. I'm going to, the, the Pharisaic version of everything that we heard in the gospel is this. What, it's this question to God. What is the least that I have to do to get away with the most while formally not breaking the law? That's basically the question of the Pharisees. What is the least I must do to obey God's law and not break the law and get away with the most? Jesus' question is this. What is the most pleasing thing to God and how can I love it more and do it more? The contrast could not be greater. I want to put it in concrete terms. It is as if a husband said to Well, what if a husband said to a priest, Father, what is the least I need to do for my wife? The minimum, just to keep her okay and keep her, you know, make her shut up and stop pestering me. What's the least? Would you wives be impressed if your husbands came and asked me that? Would you be impressed? Would you be happy? Why? He's still your husband. He's asking for the least. Okay. Now, if our attitude to, our, to wives, such an attitude is so deplorable, how much more so is it when that attitude is towards God? What's the least I need to do to keep God's law? Jesus fulfills the law. He does not abolish it. My heart breaks when I see silly things like, oh, some new synodal commission says... Oh, Doctrine must be reviewed, by which they mean they want to water down the church's teachings. They'll say things like, oh, well, you know, 
the majority of Catholics use contraception, so it must be okay. Well, let's, let's change the church's law on contraception. Right. Let's follow that logic through. The majority of Catholics lie. Let's make lying a virtue. Let's tell everyone, tell every Catholic, you feel free to lie if you want to. Why not? But then scripture tells us, the father of lies is Satan. And it is he who is spreading such confusion, even in the church. It is his lie. There is something called the census fide. You will, you will probably hear about this more and more in the next two years. Literally in Latin, it means the sense of faith. It's kind of an instinct in baptized Catholics for the substance of the faith. Now, they use this, this misused, rather, when they say, oh, look, you know, like all these Catholics are for contraception. That's the census fide. No, <laughs> it's the minority of young couples who are faithful and not using contraception. That's a manifestation of the census fide. You cannot have the sense of faith without faith. Okay? For example, when you have chastity, you also have a sensus chastity, castitas. You would have a sensus castitatis, a sense of chastity, which is you would dress more modestly. You know, I don't turn up for mass in my thongs or whatever. I don't have any thongs. But, okay. <laughs> you know, I have modesty to cover myself up for your sake and mine and for God's. Okay? So in the same way, faith is guarded by the sense of faith. Who has the sense of faith? St. John Henry Newman tells us. He lists six different conditions. I urge you to look them up because you will also hear St. John Henry Newman's name bandied about in the next two years, misused, misquoted, and he will be lied about. But John Henry Newman tells us the sense of faith manifests in those who are prayerful. Who would I consult about the Synod? I'll tell you. The little grandmothers who come to church and pray their rosary, not all of them, not the ones with the sour, as Pope Francis would call them, sour pusses, but the ones who know how to smile and pray their rosary. I would consult them about the faith. And so I give you a foolproof test. If the faith should ever become confused in your lifetime, ask yourself, which one would my grandmother believe? The granny test is probably infallible. Granny or Baba here in Croatia and Herzegovina. Use this test. Jesus' fulfillment of the law makes the law even harder. In fact, he makes it impossible. Remember what he says about divorce. The apostles then say, in that case, it's better not to marry. And God says, uh, Jesus says, for man, this is impossible. But for God, nothing is impossible. It can only be lived by one gift, the gift you heard about in the second reading, the highest gift, that is, the gift of the divine spirit. There is no higher gift than this. And to give us the Holy Spirit, God gives us what he calls, what we call sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace, think of it in two ways. Number one, uncreated sanctifying grace is the Holy Spirit himself. Created sanctifying grace is what God does in us to make us pleasing to him so that the whole trinity can dwell in us, so that we can live the life of all the virtues. And not just the virtues, but the sense of the virtues, guarding them, protecting them in us. Be prayerful, therefore. Have frequent recourse to the sacraments and pray your rosary every day. When I taught in the seminary, as I was telling Fa Father Patrick earlier, when I taught in Oscott, I told my seminarians, I consider a day when you don't pray the rosary as a day wasted. Pray the rosary every day. Don't tell me it's boring. If you think it's boring, it's because you are boring. The life of Jesus and Mary is not boring. Pray the rosary. Krunitsa. Svaki dan. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.